Located southeast of mainland Asia in the western Pacific Ocean is the Republic of the Philippines. It is an archipelago of 7,107 beautiful islands grouped into three divisions, Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. From its majestic mountains and lush rainforests to its crystal clear seas, its outstanding beauty can be seen everywhere. No wonder it's known as the Pearl of the Orient. But behind its beauty, the poverty is striking. It is evident everywhere, especially in the undeveloped provinces. Life is even harder when people get sick. Getting assistance on time is risky and sometimes impossible due to the mountainous terrain in very remote islands. Despite all these difficulties, God has sent help. In 2007, the Philippine Adventist Medical Aviation Services, a faith-based, volunteer-driven organization, was born. It humbly started its work with a two-seater helicopter, providing emergency medical evacuation in the mountainous and remote regions of Palawan. Working with local churches and assisting ministries like Adventist Frontier Missions had helped to sustain, advance, and expand the gospel and medical missionary work throughout Palawan. After three years, that old small helicopter retired, but over the past six years, God has indeed blessed Palmas. It has grown and expanded its work to meet the growing needs of the people here in the Philippines through its aviation and medical support. in the head. How long? Just now or? Uh, just now. I have just now, starting to see the head. It's almost coming out, but it's not like mm -hmm. drowning. When, when she has okay. a contraction, then it can, comes out. I can already mm -hmm. see the head. And how many hours has she been in labor? Oh, it, it, it started in labor last night. Last yeah. night. And but then the water. water yes. Rose is 11.30 a.m. This morning. Yeah, this morning. Okay. Her Flight 60 to 70 percent of our flights are emergency medical flights and these come in through calls from missionaries down in the islands uh, or in the mountains that are working back in these areas. Uh, we try to assess, you know, if this is truly a, an emergency that needs uh, medical evacuation to the hospital because obviously it's expensive to operate the aircraft. Sometimes we'll get calls where it's getting late in the day and we can't fly at night in this country. It's illegal to fly uh, VFR at night. We had a call a few weeks ago that was getting late in the day that I left about 4.30, which I figured was about as late as I could leave and still get back dark but in one of the islands down off the south end of Palawan there was a pregnant lady was having uh, complications with her delivery so I flew down there and they were ready and had her waiting to load up in the helicopter and uh, they just had her laying in a blanket they kind of slid her into the back seat onto the lap of her husband I took off and headed back and she was clearly in labor but or the delivery was not progressing and every you know every few minutes she let out a little cry or something and I was just praying that we wouldn't have to have a baby delivered in the helicopter on the way back to the hospital. 
The Palawano natives in the mountains and around um, near the mountains have a really poor situation. Uh, they have very few resources and um, if they have any problems or emergencies, there's really not much that they can do. They really, they'll either just die in the mountains or um, if there's some missionaries around that can help them, then they um, have some hope. They don't even have enough money usually to get to the hospital, so, you know, 20, 40 pesos, um, or two dollars to even get a tricycle to get transportation to the hospital, they can't afford that oftentimes. Or if they can afford that, or they can borrow some money, they'll get to the hospital and then uh, they can't afford the medicines. The government hospitals here are very um, good to the, the native uh, Palawanos and those who can't afford, they will you know, provide free rooms and maybe one meal for the patient or the patient's watcher only. They'll, the doctor will be free. But any surgeries, any medicines like that that aren't available, if the medicines are available, they'll be free. But if they're not available in the hospital, then they have to buy them outside in other pharmacies. And of course, it's extremely expensive, so they can't afford that. The other problem is they don't always know the language of the lowlands, so they don't know Tagalog necessarily, many of them from the remote areas. So if they go to the hospital, they can't communicate with the doctors and nurses, and they're also discriminated against with their clothing or because they can't speak, and they're treated very poorly by the lowlanders. Here in Palawan, the groups of people that we're reaching are varied. Um, we have the lowlander, Tagalog-speaking Filipinos. We also are reaching up into the mountain, both with the education, but the helicopter medical work to our native Palawanos. But the airplanes are more often going across the Sulu Sea here and working with the islands that are predominantly Muslim. So it's very overwhelming. <laughs> Just to know how to reach each group um, is an ongoing prayer of ours. Our airplanes are taking patients from, you know, from other islands, but also we have patients here in, in our house. Every day, sometimes every day, you know, they knock on your door and think that we're doctors. But praise the Lord, we are doctors. All of us are doctors, should be doctors, and using simple remedies different kinds of diseases or illness that they they're that we're facing cough and colds sometimes tv or hypertension it's only by god's grace that we can do that most of the flights we make for medical stuff for the indigenous people you know they have absolutely no money and emergency medical evacuation with a helicopter would be thousands of dollars in the US but you know we don't we don't try to charge anything or expect anything from from these people and God's been faithful in, in supporting and providing for this you know method of operating. Some of the stuff we do in the airplanes for the further out areas where people do have money oftentimes they will give us donations, you know, if we do a, a medical flight for them. There are some cases where they'll give us donations, you know, a few thousand pesos or whatever they can afford, but we, when we get, you know, to our destination or to the hospital, we see that they can't even afford that, so we'll just give it back to them and not even worry about it. When we bring patients in the helicopter from the mountains or we help some uh, Palawano patient to the hospital, 
almost always we will be taking complete care of them. So their medicine, sometimes if they can't understand uh, Tagalog, we'll be translating for them. Sometimes they don't have pots to cook their food, or blankets, sheets, um, many things that they will need while they're in the hospital. So we help them with all of those things. For us to get home, it's three hours of hiking on trails about this wide, up on one side, down on the other. Uh, very, very steep, rainy season, very, very slippery. When you come to visit us, you will probably give some blood to accomplish mm -hmm. that. Times when it took us 12 hours hauling people out on a stretcher on those kind of trails. and. Uh, I mean, when I, I'm at that question, I think of Kundar. He was our next door neighbor. I really liked Kundar. He's an old man, but you know, he's just a, a good guy, good neighbor. And we were gone, and he got sick. And he had nowhere to go, so he started hiking out of the mountains to, uh, to get to the hospital. And he made it out of, the ho out of the mountains, all the way to the lowlands, and died right there. And I just think if, if you know, if somebody had been there, that he could be alive today. And then you add to that that we have work that we're trying to do, 12 hours hike farther into the mountains, and actually we had to close down that work because when people got sick there, it was so difficult to get them out. We, it was just almost impossible. You get back into some of these mountainous areas in this country and there's indigenous or native Filipinos living back in these areas there's still some completely isolated from the outside world. There's still a number of tribal groups that have not been touched or entered at all by people from the lowlands or missionaries or anyone. And they're still living, you know, very primitively, just subsisting and very ignorant, dirty, sick, huge amount of health problems. And here in Palawan, malaria is a big problem. We also see that the physical needs is not enough. That's not all that people need. Oftentimes, you know, we can help them with their physical needs, but so oftentimes they'll have spiritual problems or um, they'll have fighting amongst their family members or their neighbors, and they don't know how to take care of these things. And so we also try to help them with their spiritual needs. Over the past five or six years, we have started three churches and our missionaries are running, helping to operate four churches. And right now we're building a fifth church. So the church planting work is ongoing, but we also find that we have to slow down because there's no merit in just building new churches. I think it's more important to God if those churches are strong before we move away and put our energies elsewhere. I thought working in Pamas is just aviation, but I never thought that it's so vast, you know, it's so huge, that sometimes you are overwhelmed. Like every Sabbath, you know, you can just ride your own car and go to church, but this, no. You have to have your car and then put a trailer back on it and not just, you know, adults who come in in the church, but also the children. thing about this country is most people don't have their personal transportation like motorcycles or you know cars that they can just hop in and drive to church each day so there's not a church nearby you know within walking distance 
then oftentimes they want to build a church. So we have helped with a number of churches like this. Oftentimes we're not doing any more than just providing a little bit for nails and different basic things. And they're very simple. They're uh, just bamboo uh, construction usually with, you know, a grass roof. But it's, you know, it's adequate and that's the way these people, most of them, the native people live very simply and so that's perfectly fine for them. Ano naman ang isang bagay ang ginagyan ng Diyos ng tubig? Hindi totoo. Pag report ko dyan sa town site, ang sabi ng isa sa elder. When I reported at church in town, one of the elders approached me and asked, Brother Nitz, are you the one who's giving Bible studies in the highland? What if there's a sheep who's going to accept it? Will there be any fold for them? So I answered him, Brother, if you're thinking about the sheepfold, there will be no problem with that if you just help us build a fold for the highlands. Most of our members here are natives. As far as I know, I'm the only Ilongo here. We built a small church because the members were just a few back then. However, gradually, as time has gone by, the roof is getting damaged and it has holes in it. I also noticed we are beginning to overcrowd. The members are getting bigger and the church is getting smaller. And that is why we need to extend. I think what I like most about our Bible workers is their dedication. Um, not just to the ministry, but to God's uh, mandate to spread the gospel. Um, I also appreciate the fact that they are not focused just on baptisms. It seems to be uh, an agreement with all of us that we would prefer conversions, <laughs> real conversions, instead of just baptisms, which is easy to get. But a true-hearted conversion is not so easy to get. There were three previous teachers who were saying that they had difficulty controlling students because they were always having fainting spells. But actually they were being possessed by evil spirits. I was possessed with an evil spirit and I didn't have any idea what I was doing. I was told that I took my clothes off. I really didn't know that I was doing that. They just told me. We don't know exactly why there's a lot of demon possession here, but I believe some of the reasons is that, uh, especially among the Paloanos and even in other areas, there's still a lot of satanic ritual things going on. They don't even realize what they're doing, but you know, in the mountains, they have their, their various gods that they're, you know, uh, serving. But then there's also the bad spirits, and they communicate with them. They'll um, try to appease them with sacrifices and things like that. But sometimes they'll even, um, on purpose, interact with these uh, bad spirits. <laughs> Because of what we have heard, we were afraid, but we depended on one. It was God alone whom we depended upon, and He was the one who gave us strength and wisdom on what we should do. Since we arrived here, nothing else has happened. There has been no more demon possessions. That's why we have Bible workers and missionaries, missionary families, and various workers that can help not only with their physical problems but their spiritual problems as well and we have multiple Bible workers in the mountains and in, around the lowlands as God provides and as we see the needs many many people are requesting help um, many re people are requesting Bible studies or missions to be placed in their villages and areas and um, the opportunities are endless. We desire to see the whole Philippines you know covered with air support that would mean having four or five air bases with a helicopter and 
maybe an airplane at each base. And now, with the helicopter, one hour on foot is equal to one minute in the helicopter. I mean, we can go places and do things, you know, medical emergencies. It can make the difference between life and death. There's no doubt about that, that we can get somebody out of the mountains. We can get them to the hospital quickly, efficiently, without the trauma of hauling them on these steep trails. To me, it's really neat to see technology, which very often is used for just rich people, but to have it being used for aiding the poorest of the poor and forwarding the work of God and giving that privilege to people who would otherwise never, never have it. To be saving lives, to be taking the gospel, uh, what, a, what a fantastic chance to do that. It would be very hard for us without the presence of Pamas because we can only transport patients here by sea. So we would like to thank the Pamas family and the service that we have been looking forward to for so long and now it is within our reach. During the rest of the year the ships do go but very sporadically. So when it comes to medical emergencies, the only way to access these people give them the care that they need is by air. But I have to say, that even though the dangers are real, the most rewarding part is when the head doctor from the island texts me and says, Sean, the baby lived or the mother lived. Some of the passengers will text me themselves and they'll say, praise God, last time my wife took the ship and our baby died, this time she rode the airplane and I have a son. So even though the dangers are real, and what we have to face out here in this tropical weather over this ocean is, is challenging. But when we know lives are being saved, uh, there's a reward that comes from that that offsets any of the challenges that we face. There's a big need to get in and to reach these people with the gospel and also with health education, with different things that will improve their lives and lead them hopefully to be saved eternally as well.